Well, thanks everybody for being here as what is, um, we're pretty sure, the last of our research ethics lecture series. It's been a really fun run over the last two years, and I'm really excited to wrap up with this talk in particular. Uh, my name is Jonathan Beaver. I'm a senior po postdoctoral fellow at the Rock Ethics Institute. I've had a really good time over the last two years thinking and working with you all on research ethics, research integrity issues here on campus. I wanted to thank our staff, as always, Rob Peeler, Deb Triolanis, and Carolyn Umbrick for their help in organizing the series. Without them, it would have been a complete disaster, other than just a little bit of a disaster like it is normally. And huge thanks also to Doug and Julie Rock for their support of the, our work at the Rock Ethics Institute. Without them, we would just be the Ethics Institute. So we're thankful there for their support as well. Uh, a couple of business items. For those people who are here for sorry credit, if there is anybody, um, Rob Peeler in the back and his staff will help you uh, turn in the forms and get whatever credit you need to get at the end after the Q&A tonight. I usually ask people, and I will ask you this time as well, to silence your cell phones for the talk. But in this case, keep them handy, because it looks like we'll put them to good use partway through this talk, which I think will be a lot of fun and different than what we normally do. It's my great pleasure to introduce Tom Seeger. Dr. Tom Seeger is an associate professor in the School of Sustainable Engineering in the Built Environment at Arizona State University and the director of the Sustainable Energy and Environmental Decision Sciences, or SEEDS, laboratory. Dr. Seeger leads research teams working at the boundaries of engineering and social science to understand resilient infrastructure systems, the life cycle, <coughs> environmental consequences of emerging energy technologies, um, novel approaches to teamwork and communication strategies, and engineering ethics, among a variety of other things. He's got a wide range of current research sponsors, including the National Science Foundation, the Army Corps of Engineers, the EPA, and several industry partners as well. And I could, and probably should, in fact, go on about his startup companies, his not-for-profit not networks, his research lab, these impressively big collaborative networks of folks he set up around sustainability and science communication. But instead, I wanted to share just a brief story about how I got to know Tom. It wasn't at an academic, traditional academic conference, and it wasn't through traditional collaborative research, although I and countless others know him in those contexts as well. Instead, twice now, I found myself, weirdly, twice now, I found myself on these really sort of epic desert road trips with Tom, driving down long stretches of highway through these incredible rainstorms into dramatic dusk desert courses among collections of cacti. It's really been an impressive experience. We've talked about everything from life and ethics to politics and engineering and families, a wide range of things. And to me, those epic experiences are a lot like Tom's orientations to research and to education. He's pushing his students and mentees like myself to thinking in new ways and challenging the perspectives they have on the world around them. And even though I sometimes get the impression that no one really knows where we're headed in discussions like those, we always end up somewhere really awesome. And so I'm really happy to introduce Tom for what I know will be an awesome talk tonight entitled A Game-Based Experiential Approach to Teaching Professional Ethics. Please help me welcome Dr. Tom Seeker. Yeah, Jonathan said silence your uh, cell phones. And um, I want you to use your cell phones. Uh, you didn't mention what the hashtag for live tweeting uh, this event is, if you are. We're going to live tweet. Do we have a hashtag? Yeah, we have a hashtag. R E L S 15. There we go. Yeah, would you? R E L S 15. All right, that sounds great. I use Twitter in my classroom uh, to enhance class participation, so I'm quite accustomed to having people looking down at their phones and creating tweets while I'm talking. Don't think that it's rude if you're paying more attention to uh, what your neighbors are saying on Twitter than you're paying uh, to me. Their filtered interpretation of whatever I'm saying might be a lot more interesting. And I know that there are people back in Arizona who are on Twitter looking for your comments to see however it is you're interpreting this experience. It, uh, it's going to be a little bit different from what Jonathan tells me that you've come to expect from the lecture series. I am an associate professor of sustainable engineering at Arizona State University. But it turns out I kind of discovered accidentally I'm also a game designer. And game design is a good way to teach three of the things that I'm responsible for in my undergraduate engineering business class. Those are leadership, teamwork, and ethics. So now I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what I'm doing in ethics education, a little bit about the game. And I want to reserve uh, enough time to discuss, 
to um, get a sense of the game and then invite you to play. We play this game over Twitter. So if you're not on Twitter yet, download the app, open up yourself an account, create a hashtag uh, RELS15 tweet, welcoming yourself to the Twitterverse, and then I will show you how you can participate in our game at the end of this session. Let me tell you uh, what's going on in ethics education and sustainable engineering. This is a paper from 1998. And it points out when the American Society of Civil Engineers, I'm a civil engineer, uh, included in its fundamental canons of ethics the principles of sustainability. And it suggested that civil engineers should accord with these principles of sustainability. But according to my friend Arnie Veselin, it didn't give us a lot of guidance on how we're supposed to uh, embody these principles in our practice as professionals. So now, as a faculty member whose job it is to teach ethics to future engineers, I'm sort of left to grapple with the idea of how do I teach the fundamental canons which now incorporate uh, principles of sustainable development. And there are at least two things about sustainable development that are different than other kinds of professional ethics problems. The first one I've got represented on the left of the slide, and this is the problem of intergenerational equity. Ethics and equity go together. We've always concerned ourselves with problems of equity, but this particular problem is unique because we have no way of negotiating or understanding or empathizing with the future generations that we constrain. That is, we can't, we can't call up our unborn great-grandchildren and ask them what kind of world they would like to inherit. And yet, the decisions that we make today are going to constrain the alternatives that they have available to them in the future. It's not just a question of finite resources. It's a question of uh, what kind of atmosphere, what kind of biodiversity, what kind of technology. What would they consider to be a high quality of life? It's not something that we can have direct access to. So we have to, in our mind, imagine what these future generations might like and what our duty is to people whom we have no contact with. The second, which is related, is what formulation of sustainability we hold dear. There are two, weak and strong sustainability. So what I've got up here for you is a photo of an island in the South Pacific called Nauru. You can see it's located uh, northeast of Australia, and it's been the topic of a book written by uh, Carl McDaniel and John Gowdy called Paradise for Sale. Now, Uru was noted for its incredibly rich phosphate rock deposits, and it exemplifies something called weak sustainability. Now, Uru used to be one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and this is because of the phosphate rock that was there. They mined out all the phosphate rock, leaving behind what you see here, sold it off and created a trust fund for the citizens of Nauru that was supposed to keep them in uh, riches for generations to come. However, they lost all that money in a currency crisis that hit Southeast Asia. They're now back to impoverished and they have no more phosphate rock. The question is, what do we owe the future generations? We learned that from the left part of the slide. Do we owe them sustainability in this strong sense, which is a world in kind? The world that we inherited is the world that we owe to future generations. It should have the phosphate deposits. It should have the fossil fuels. It should have the blue whales. It should have a, a representation of all of the resources that we've inherited. Or are these resources substitutable for one another? Is it OK? as stewards of the future generation, to sell off all this phosphate rock and instead give our future generations cash. Cash that can be used to build whatever kind of future they think they value. The weak sustainability view says that resources are substitutable, that maybe what the future wants is a virtual reality experience of a blue whale and not a blue whale itself. And we should give them the resources that they need uh, to create the future that they want, but not necessarily reproduce the resources that we inherited in kind. So we have the weak versus strong sustainability problem, and we have the intergenerational equity problem. These are two critically important ethical dilemmas that are presented by sustainability that don't exist in other domains of thinking about engineering ethics. So how do we think about engineering ethics? I know somebody in the audience recognizes this picture. You can go ahead and tweet it out, or you can raise your hand, or I'm just getting a little affirmation over here. What do we got? 
Yeah, there are a lot of space shuttles. This one's famous because it blew up. This is the challenge. Thank you. Well, we have to wait this all do together. This is the Challenger explosion in January 1986. This represents one of the ways that are, or the way that we teach engineering ethics right now. We look at these uh, historical retrospective case studies, mostly of things that went wrong, but not always things that went wrong. This is a photo of the Citicorp Tower in Manhattan. It's got this unusual geometry at the base because it was built around an existing church. They wanted the tower, but they wanted to preserve the church. So instead of putting the load-bearing columns in the corners, like all the skyscrapers have them, they put them in the middle of the wall and uh, built up several floors so that they could preserve the church underneath. The Challenger is used as an example of a case study that with a negative outcome in engineering ethics that said, oh, if only we'd had more ethical engineers, they never would have launched the Challenger under cold temperatures in which the O-ring failed. The Citicorp Tower is used as a positive ethical case study because when they discovered that a change in the connections inside the tower from welded as it was designed to bolted as it was construction, or as it was constructed, weakened the tower under hurricane winds. They went back and they retrofitted the tower in order to ensure that it would never fall down. Terrific. This is a case of someone admitting a mistake and doing the right things, the way this is uh, presented. I got one more for you. What's this? Andy remembers this. This is the Ford Pinto. And what was the problem with the Ford Pinto? When you hit it in the back, and you didn't have to be going very fast, it, what is it? Yeah, the gas tank explodes, incinerating the driver. And Ford is famous, I should say infamous, for having its engineers do a study. This is the early 1970s. And this is how Ralph Nader made a name for himself that cost Al Gore the election, depending upon how you, you know, buy your politics. Ralph Nader was the one who filed the lawsuit against Ford and publicized uh, this problem so that eventually they were forced to recall the Pinto. Ford is infamous for doing a study in which it calculated that it was cheaper to compensate the victims of the Pinto than it was to recall and repair all the gas tanks. Not a positive example of engineering ethics. So now you can see our response as a profession is to look at these positive and negative examples, dramatize them for our students so the students understand where have we gone wrong in the past, where have we gone right. And when we go over these, the students swear on a stack of Bibles and all their multiple choice exams that they would never incinerate their customers. They would never have launched the Challenger under cold temperatures in which the O-ring you know, becomes too brittle to form a seal. And of course, they would reinforce the connections of the Citicorp Tower so that it is resistant to hurricane force quartering winds. They get all the right answers. Because as it turns out, I teach a classroom full of moral saints. But the problem is that when we do this sort of retrospective, fictionalized case study, we oversimplify everything. The students really see actors. They see the bad apples and the good whistleblowers. And they understand that the, the moral of this story is to encourage them to be good whistleblowers. If they were to recognize exactly the situation that we studied in class, they would get the right answer. The problem with ethical problems is that they never present in the same way twice. It's always more complicated than our fictionalized retrospective case studies make it seem. As a matter of fact, the play Wicked, uh, or the musical, which is one of my daughter's favorite, sort of plays on this. It says the right or the wrong thing, the good or the bad thing, depends upon your perspective. It depends upon how you give meaning to the events that unfold. And because ethical problems are always more complicated than the black and white, the good and the bad, in fact, our students are poorly prepared to encounter their own ethical dilemmas through their career simply by looking at these retrospective case studies. That's because ethical problems are wicked problems. And Wicked Problems is a reference to this paper in, I think it's 1973, by Rattel and Weber uh, that came out of urban planning. They identified these 10 characteristics of Wicked Problems that show us that they have no resolution. I'm sorry, there's no single solution. That is when you, for example, formulate a wicked problem, you simultaneously constrain the solution. If we think of unemployment as a problem of education, then the answer clearly becomes more education. And we can go back and forth with social problems like this that relate to sustainability, constantly trying to resolve and resolve and resolve the problem without ever reducing its complexity. In fact, 
Wicked problems first appeared in the literature six years earlier in 1967. This is a colleague of Rattel's at Berkeley who was talking about a seminar that he gave, describing it into the journal and coining this term, wicked problems. This is uh, Churchman's interpretation of wicked problems as explicitly related to moral problems. In Churchman's mind, if you're not recognizing wicked problems and treating them as wicked, treating them as morally complex, and trying to encompass as much of the problem as you can, you are morally wrong. Well, now we have to tackle sustainability. To do it, Churchman says we need to look at the whole. So this is a poster, really kind of a cartoon, that I did with some friends at a Frontiers of Engineering Education workshop this was in California, Long Beach, I think, something like that, where we all got together and we talked about what were the crazy things that we were doing in education. And I brought games. Part of the uh, poster in blue shows us the Kolb learning cycle. And here the idea is that you need to go through all four of these types of activities in order to create a meaningful learning experience. That is um, abstraction, experimentation, experience, and reflection. The humanities, where most ethics education resides, where this uh, read, discuss, write approach to teaching ethics resides, humanities are very good at abstraction and reflection. Engineering, on the other hand, abstraction, think mathematical abstraction, uh, abstractions of the real world, and experimentation, think chem lab or physics lab. Neither discipline gets the whole Kolb learning cycle down. So what I want to do now is I want to bring uh, experimentation and experience to ethics education. I want to bring reflection to engineers. And I don't want to lose the abstraction where we might find moral theory, for example. How am I going to do that? How do you experiment with ethics education? How do you experience ethical problems? Because it doesn't sound very ethical to set your students up into these moral dilemmas and ask them to experience them. If they mess this up, there could be real consequences. For me, the idea was games. We're going to create a virtual experience, something that has the students emotionally invested in the outcome, something where there are real choices to be made. Because if you're not putting anything at risk, it's not a moral choice but where the consequences aren't so bad that they would be irrevocable. Here now, students can experiment with different moral ideas, with different behaviors, with different kinds of negotiating or communicating with one another. And they can, if it's a game, do it over and over again. And through reflection, decide for themselves what are the aspects that they're most satisfied with. So we worked up this paper, and we talked about where traditional education uh, resides. And we contrasted that with transformative education. What we try and do in reflection is we use this metaphor of a mirror. Hold the mirror up to the students so they can see how they've behaved, and then ask themselves whether they're satisfied with themselves and what would they change. This is the experience that we're trying to create with the game, get all the way around uh, the Kolb learning cycle, and engage all three aspects of their mind. What are those three aspects? I've written them in black in the middle. The cognitive, what they think. The affective, what they feel. And here's this new word, the conative, what they actually do. So thinking, feeling, acting are all going to be engaged at different stages of this uh, Kolb learning cycle. Keep that in mind. It's going to come up a little later. So here are the games that uh, our students are used to playing. Jonathan and I were talking about this at dinner. Uh, we both evidently grew up playing Risk. I grew up in a game household. And this is how I know that I've, or how I've discovered that I'm a game designer. Because the best way to play Risk is to make up your own rules. You, like you go by the rules that are written on the inside of the cover, and it gets boring, and the games go on forever. So inevitably, you start thinking of new things that you want to do with your friends. You have to negotiate out these rules. You test them out, play test them to see if it's more fun to do it that way. And now every family has its own way of playing risk. That's not the way that my children experience games. It's not that they can't play risk, but now they don't bother with the dice and the pieces and that or a game board. They play online. When you play online, now everything is mediated by the digital interface, by whatever the expectations of the game designer were. The channels that the players go down are highly constrained by whatever technological availability exists for them. It's not like you can just agree with a bunch of people that you're online with that you're going to change the rules and move the dice around and, I don't know, reshuffle the cards or whatever it's going to be. So you lose this creative design component. You lose some of that negotiation component when you play online. 
And this is a game that my son discovered when he was about 12. This is called Tribal Wars. We're living in Rochester. He's in the seventh grade. And I'm working at Rochester Institute of Technology to create a new PhD program in sustainability. And my son is getting really into these online games. In this game, you, it's kind of got this medieval motif. You found a village. You create armies and soldiers. You, there's a technology tree. It's kind of classic in that regard. But it explicitly positions people in this collective action problem. It's so that when you form a tribe, lots of little villages are strong enough to overcome one bigger village. So the game presents you with this coordination problem which you need to cooperate with other people. Tribes have governance structures, as it turns out, and bulletin boards and debates about how they should counterattack or what the right thing to do is in certain situations. And my son's really into it, but he's getting his butt kicked. He says, Dad, I really like this game. And I got my village up to whatever it is, you know, 8,000 points or something like that. And then as soon as I get, reach that threshold, somebody comes in, they steal my stuff. He goes, my problem is I go to school. This is one of those 24-hour games where the more you play, the better you do. And then you can like pay a little bit of money and you can get like a slight edge and that kind of thing. And he goes, I'm in school and some kid in Russia attacks me and takes all my stuff. I can't do anything. He goes, Dad, you go to school, but you're in front of a computer all day. Would you mind, you know, just <laughs> log in, just move my soldiers around a little bit, see if anything is happening. And maybe you, I'll get my village and I'll keep it for a little while longer. I'm like, for you, son. I'll play. I log in, and of course, I'm hooked. That's what these games are designed to do. So now I open up my own account, and I'm playing Tribal Wars, and they start like this new world. And I'm like, oh, yes, I'll get in here quick. I'll get all the resources. Six weeks later, I'm the number four player in the world. And there are like 25,000 people playing this game. But here's the thing, you know, I got a PhD. I'm like this middle-aged guy. I'm not going to let these 12-year-olds kick my ass. I don't have to join any tribe because I know so much better. So I'm this huge guy, no tribe anywhere. Remember how the game is designed? Lots of little villages can uh, overcome one big village. And unbeknownst to me, there are thousands, evidently, of Danish and German school children conspiring against me. They're pretty angry that I'm not joining their little clubs and I'm kicking their butt on their village and they send me like these little messages, oh, why are you picking on me? And I'm like, hey, it's called tribal wars. It's not like tribal feel good about one another. I'm taking your village. Which was probably not the right message to send, you know, if I, <laughs> if I wanted to be diplomatic in this game. They collect hundreds of players all going to attack me at once. 11,000 incoming attacks. Wake up one morning, I'm like, what the? So I call my son. I'm like, son, look at this. He goes, wow, dad, you're really cool. I have earned, you know, for my game addiction problem, my son's admiration. He goes, what are you going to do? I'm like, I tell you what I'm going to do. I am not going to sleep. I'm going to like protect every village that I can as all these attacks are coming in at different times, and many of them decoy attacks and all this. I survived the first 1,000 attacks in really good shape. I lose like two villages or something. And my son thinks I am like the tribal wars god of something or other. He's like, you are doing amazingly well. But all the other school children playing this game are doubly angry. So now they're like, OK, we'll do 22,000 attacks. And they're all piling. I'm not sleeping for more than 45 minutes at a time, because you never know when someone in Malaysia is going to log on and you know, like hit your village. 22,000 attacks is more than the server can handle, and the whole world crashes. Thank God, because at this point, I kind of can get like a little bit of a reality check. Like, what's happening with this whole tribal wars in my life? What am I going to do with this? I wind up talking to a friend at uh, RIT in philosophy. And I tell him about these guilds and these meetings and these governance structures and things like that. He goes, you have ethics as part of your core curriculum in this new sustainability PhD program, don't you? I'm like, well, yes, I do. He goes, well, how are you going to teach it? I'm like, well, you know, we have case studies, and we talk about Nauru and stuff like that. He goes, you might want to, we could, what if we did a game? So we start thinking about what are the important problems in sustainability that are amenable to this uh, sort of game dynamic. Tragedy of the commons, uh, free rider problem, uh, prisoner's dilemma. Uh, we could do the trolley problem if we wanted to do the trolley problem. We can take some of these classic philosophical and economic dilemmas. We can model them 
in a game environment, and instead of these kind of interminable arguments about what's right or wrong, we can allow people to experiment with different actions. This is the conative part. And then they can see how do other people respond to them. What's right? What's wrong? When do you attack? When are you justified in taking a village? And when do you show mercy, for example? All these things can play out, but in a classroom environment. So we wrote a proposal, and that got funded. The game looks kind of like this. We did four different games. This is the one that has been most popular and grown the fastest. This is a Tragedy of the Commons game. Uh, you manage the fish that are in the lake. And it gives you both the intergenerational equity and the weak versus strong sustainability that I was talking about earlier. The fish in the lake reproduce. And we use a classic model of logistic growth. The lake has a carrying capacity. So we use the models that biologists use in order to uh, model reproduction of fish in the lake. You go into the lake with a boat. The boat can only hold so much. Every village gets a boat. You can fish as much as the boat holds. And then you can either hold the fish on what we call the stringer. Uh, this is a rope that goes through the fish's gills. The fish stay alive, but they can't reproduce. You can eat them later. Or you can sell fish to do two things, invest in infrastructure. One thing you can do is increase the size of your boat, collect more fish. The other thing you can do is you can build a private pond from the proceeds of these fish sales. And you can get more fish, and you can stock your pond with your own private fish. So think about the tragedy of the commons, the way it was originally presented in the late 60s by Garrett Hardin. Privatization was put forth as the solution to the tragedy of the commons. We've created a privatization solution. And not only that, we've built into this pond infrastructure an economy of scale. There's some reasoning behind that. Uh, the cost of a vessel is generally proportional to its surface area. And the surface area increases with the square of the radius. But the volume, which is the benefit of the vessel, increases with the cube of the radius. So this shows economies of scale. Now there are a couple of different collective action problems that we've built into this tragedy of the commons game. First, we divide the class up into 12 groups. We do it according to their zodiac sign. So it's random and ridiculous. Now we have these groups of different sizes. And of course, each person in the group needs to eat so many fish. In this case, it's four. So really large group, small boat, they're impoverished. Big boat, small group, they're rich. We've created injustices in the game right from the outset. And we will not correct them. Because the idea here is to illustrate that these injustices exist in the world and to give students the design space that they need to experiment with different ways of correcting them or addressing them. Great. So you've got different sized villages, different sized boats. You have one collective action problem. How do the villages work together? Now you have another collective action problem. How, I mean, how do the people in one village work together? How do the different villages around the lake share the common resource? Or would they share private infrastructure in order to capture economies of scale? So you can see they're faced with the weak versus strong sustainability. What do you owe future generations? What's the pathway to sustainability? Maybe it's the technological solution in which you build a larger boat or your own private pond. Or maybe it's the ecological solution in which you work collectively with others to manage these collective ecological resources. They have those two choices. So you might ask, what's the intergenerational component? We play this game at ASU every year in engineering. And then we hand it off to the School of Sustainability, where they have a sustainability justice class. They play it there. They just played it at University of Wisconsin-Madison. We're going to play it at University of Oregon in about 10 days. We'll see if there are people who want to play it at Penn State. Each time one class finishes it, the next class inherits the mess that the former class left them. So there are two aspects of this. First. Your grade depends upon how many fish you eat. It depends on how greedy you are. And I get some pushback from instructors. They're like, no, no, no. You should be rewarding ethical behavior with good grades. That's the message you want to send the students. I'm like, no. Remember, it's not a moral decision unless it involves some kind of risk or some kind of sacrifice. It becomes a moral choice if you're willing to put your own grade at risk in order to benefit other people in the class or future generations. And remember, there's two solutions. The private solution, in which you hoard fish for yourself, or the collective solution. Maybe we all, as good stewards of the lake, 
can all get A's. The way we calibrate the math, we shoot for like a B plus on the collective solution, and you can get an A as long as you can dupe all of your classmates into being suckers while you hoard the fish on the private solution. So the incentives are a little bit complicated here. But the idea is you must put something at risk in order to, to practice making a moral choice. You have a, uh, your own incentive structure, whatever duty it is that you accept to your classmates, and then the future generations to think about. Terrific. And here's the kicker, we play the game over Twitter. Why do we play the game? Well, we started with index cards and a spreadsheet. And then we wanted to start playing the game internationally. We wanted to start playing the game with a student cohort in Uganda and another one in India. We wanted to play globally. And this is because we wanted to experiment with what different cultural expectations are about collective action, about environmental stewardship. And it turns out it's really important. Not everyone approaches this problem of the commons the same way that our students in the United States approach it. But we can't count on internet access in East Africa or even in India for that matter. So we said, what is the communications platform that is the lowest bandwidth, which we have the most access for a global population? We decided that was 140 characters at a time. However, if you try and sign up 65 Ugandan students to Twitter all at once, you will crash Twitter in East Africa. I'm speaking from experience. It took a week for them to bring their servers back up just to accommodate what we were trying to do on Twitter. So there's a lot of Twitter activity that goes on all at once. And in this, at that time, it just wasn't uh, expected. So we have a series of syntax commands that people issue through Twitter in, to uh, manage their resources. They get feedback from our server that tells them how they're doing in the game. And this allows us to play, just like Tribal Wars, 24-7, <coughs> around the clock, around the globe, across cultures, uh, across classes. Here's what I've discovered in teaching both the traditional case study way and this new experiential way. There's a big difference between the way I'm concerned about ethics education and the way the philosophers are concerned about ethics education. So I'm kind of picking on Jonathan's discipline here. The end point of education and philosophy is understanding. Remember those three aspects of the mind, the cognitive, the affective, the cognitive. What philosophers are going for is cognitive endpoints. Do you understand the moral theories and the implications of the different ideas? I'm not going for that. Because I'm teaching professional ethics. I'm trying to bring engineers into the world. And I want them to behave in a certain way. Not just understand, but do. This is a cognitive endpoint. So I'm using a different model of moral development than the philosophers would use. And Jonathan and I have had this debate. Uh, if I get the behavioral outcomes that I want, that the profession expects of engineers, perhaps I'm shortcutting the understanding. And that might be true. Maybe this is satisfying for me as an instructor, because I'm turning out students who are able to behave in accordance with these ethical principles, even if they don't completely understand them. But what happens when they face these surprising situations? It's a legitimate question. I want all four stages of this alternative model of moral development. So I'm going to take you through them right now. The first is moral sensitivity. If you don't recognize that there's a moral problem, if you don't have that kind of awareness, then you can't do anything about it. You can't even understand it. I think we can all agree on this. After moral sensitivity comes moral judgment. The key in moral judgment is to be able to formulate alternatives. It could be interventions or solutions. But what are you going to do about this moral problem that you've become aware of? There's the judgment. After judgment, we're leaving the cognitive processes and we're beginning to enter what are, we're calling here the cognitive processes. How do you take action? This next box is about motivation. And motivation belongs to the affective part of the mind. Do you even care about the moral problem? If you don't, then you stop with understanding. But if you do, you have one more leap to make. And that's through this line that I'm calling moral courage. Remember the bit about it's not a moral decision unless it's putting something that you care about at risk. You need the courage to actually take action. In our ordinary lessons, oh, we look at the Challenger, oh, we look at the Pinto, oh, we look at the Citicorp Tower, we can go through 
moral sensitivity. We can go to moral judgment. We can have, well, we do a jury panel exercise in which they uh, critique the performance of the engineer on the Citicorp Tower. We can even make claims about whether we care, but we never test the student's courage because they don't have any skin in the game in the ordinary way that we teach ethics. Now, when we get into the uh, game environment, they are called upon to put something at risk. How do you develop courage? You practice courage. So we give them an instance in which they can decide who they are. And some of those students who swore up and down on a stack of multiple choice exams that they would never incinerate their customers are the same students that fish the crap out of the lake to extinction, hoard fish, and watch their uh, fellow classmates die a metaphorical fish starvation death. So we kind of hold that up. And we say, what happened? And I go, oh, yeah. I got a little carried away with the fish game thing. Which is exactly what happens. When we take students out of the classroom and we put them in the context of their profession, all those classroom thoughts, they're no longer accessible. They're working out of habit. These habits are very well worn because they haven't had enough experience. Instead of uh, thinking back, hmm, how does this relate to that Citicorp Tower example? They're, they're caught up in the pressure of whatever the decision is, and they wind up doing things that upon further reflection, they might regret. So this is our model. We want to get the students to this point of moral courage, and that sometimes comes with negative emotions. I hope uh, that makes some sense. Why do we do this, and how is it working out for us? On the left-hand side of this slide, I have the traditional approach to ethics education, what that gives us. On the right-hand side, I have what am I going for in the classroom when I use these games. I want to move my students from spectators to players. I want to move them from passive receptors of uh, whatever it is that we're doing in ethics to active doers. I want to move them from apathetic to emotionally invested, and I'm definitely getting that. I want to move them from situations that are narratively closed. I mean, think about it. Spoiler alert, the challenger blows up. That one's on Wikipedia. There's not really a lot of surprises coming out of that. I want the surprises. And I want to move them from situations that are predictable to, well, I've already said it, uh, surprising. So now this is my offering to you. It is a text-based Twitter game. And it kind of harkens back to the early days of incorporation of the internet into our universities. This is like a 1990s style, which is why I'm quoting war games, in case you're not familiar with you know, Ferris Bueller's other movie. Uh, it's all via the 140 characters at a time. And back in the 90s, when I was teaching, these games were just as addictive as the ones that we have now. But the, they've been superseded by the whiz-bang, first-person shooter, super 3D graphic games that we think of as video gaming. This is not the kind of gaming that we're doing. We're doing this command-based virtual world gaming, and I'm wondering if you're interested. If you are, what we're going to do is we're going to take some questions. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some discussion. And then we'll have, I'm hoping, about 45 minutes to get people who are interested set up and show you how this game works, play a couple of rounds, I mentioned that the University of Oregon and ASU might be watching what you're doing right now. For them, it will appear like a history lesson. The more fish you eat, the higher your grade goes. If you leave fish in your pond for future generations, you get those too. So you don't have to eat them. As long as you own them, you get them. And then, but they're split up among all the people in your village you know, who own the pond collectively. And then the fish in the lake will give you their, your share of the fish in the lake too. So if I have 80 people in the class and there's 800 fish in the lake, you get 10 points for just what's left behind in the lake. You get whatever you've eaten, and you get your share of what's in the pond. So it's all about the fish this grade. I'll give you an example. We played this game in Nashville at a conference of the Society of Environmental Toxicologists and uh, Chemists, CTAC. And so there's no grade involved. But people get so caught up in the competitiveness of it that talk about emotionally invested. I had one woman at the thing yelling at me. I'm like, it's a game, but I'm going for emotional investment, and I got it, you know, about how wrong something was, and somebody did some cheating with the whatever. So often what happens is people will come to me, and they'll make an appeal. I'm supposed to fix something, especially things that I broke. 
Like, I don't always get the game right. Sometimes our coding isn't right. It still has bugs in it. Uh, sometimes I'll do a data entry kind of thing that's wrong. One team, when we played this at ASU, they had a boat held 42 fish. And I entered it wrong. I knocked them down to two. They went on Twitter and they were like, what happened to our boat? I was like, uh, it sunk? Uh, typhoon? I mean, I like, stuff happens. I don't know what happened to your boat. I'm not going to fix it. So they come to me as kind of the dungeon master god mode. You should fix the injustices in the world. I'm like, I'm not going to do this. Mistakes uh, happen. So we did this in Nashville at SeaTac. And we had one group that was really big. Their boat could not hold enough fish to feed all of them. So now they're like below this subsistence level. We had another group, only two guys in it. Big boat, plenty of fish. So the big group went to the small group. And they said, um, you know, we kind of got the bad luck. Would you give us some fish so that we don't die in this game? They're like, of course. How many people? OK, it looks like you need six fish to stay alive. Six fish. We went through round one. Round two, they came back and said, you know, thanks for those six fish that you gave us to keep us alive. But we happen to notice that you got a big pond. And you increased the size of your boat. And we started thinking maybe we should have fish so that we can create our own infrastructure, doing our own kind of like international development program, and maybe you know teach somebody to fish, and they fish for a lifetime kind of thing. No, we don't want any more of this subsistence stuff, and we're willing to go on a hunger strike until you people come up with the real fish. And they were like, whoa, 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 you know, we have a plan here. We've worked out this whole sustainability thing, and this at this level, then our pond will have enough reproduction in order to sustain. And I'm sorry, but we just can't. Uh, give you the fish that you're asking for. We'll keep you alive, but um, no. <laughs> Two days later, we came to the discuss out. And the large group, um, they were frustrated. They were like, we felt powerless. Like, we didn't have anything to offer this, this rich group. There's no, how can we even negotiate from a position of such weakness? And I'm like, I see what you mean. You didn't have anything instrumental to offer them. But what you did have was the opportunity to give them a chance to do the right thing. And you know, when does that come up in your life? So I mean, you could have offered them some sort of like moral satisfaction to them. Look, you'll feel better as a person. Meanwhile, I'm watching this other guy from the small group. And as this whole conversation is unfolding in the discuss out, he starts feeling not too good as a person. We, we get around to his turn to do a reflection. He now becomes very emotional, and he's like, when I was a kid, I remember the Guatemalan earthquake, because my parents took me down to Guatemala. And we were there, and we were helping rebuild homes, and we were doing relief aid and stuff like that. And I've always thought of myself as that kind of person who does the right thing, who's generous. And now I realize that when I was confronted with this like inconsequential opportunity, there's fish, what do I care? You know? I was so caught up in my own thing. I had my little spreadsheet optimization program about how I was going to take care of myself. I was like, no. I can't do that. I'm not the person that I thought I was, he says. And I feel pretty bad about it, but it's the best thing that ever could have happened to me at this conference. That's what we're going for in the game. We want to hold the mirror up and say, is your action in accordance with your values? And is there a discrepancy between the person you want to be and the person that you actually show up as when you're under the gun like that? Often we get to that point. We couldn't do it at the conference, but we get to that point in the discuss that where people are angry, and they point fingers, and then they sort of come to this revelation that they could have done more. And the room will get quiet, like it did when I asked for comments. And someone will say, Dr. Seeger, can we play again? And I'll be like, of course you can play again. You know, what is games without a chance at redemption? Let's fire up the whole world, and let's see how good you can be at this game uh, when we do it one more time. Now, I've stopped offering that sort of um, that second life, that second chance uh, to do it over again. Because I've introduced this intergenerational component. I'm like, no, you may not do it again. But this is your last chance. You may leave a time capsule for future generations. You may write them a letter about your experience, all the regrets that you're taking to your deathbed. you know, And you may post it up on the blog, where the next university will see it. But you should know that in my experience, it will not make a damn bit of difference. They're going to play the same way and make all the same mistakes that you're making. So I love my perverse incentive structure yeah. uh, in the back. So your definition of success in this game is when the teams decide to invent their own rules 
and go beyond the score of the game, winning the score of the game. What? So why? You've why totally should somebody? Why should somebody not just say well, I'm I'm interested in the score of the game? I'm by winning this game, I'm not screwing somebody else out of the ability to do anything. It's just a game. What, why doesn't that come in as a? It does. There are people in every class who are like, no, I'm going for the game score. I need the grade. That's the way the rules are set up. I'm just living within the rules. And now they're surrounded by people who are like, why are you messing with my grade? Why aren't you with the program? Why can't you be like the rest of us? Why do you have to be that jerk who's like, I'm just in it for myself? We're all sustainable engineers. Can't you see we're trying to save the world here? The game is a metaphor, man. Do, do you see how the, I mean, now we're, you, it's collective action. So I won't enforce contracts or agreements, but when you go back to Eleanor Ostrom and she's uncovered these examples of collective action, one of the examples that she gives is the Maine lobsterman. And I don't think you're from the coast, Jonathan, but I know you're from Maine. I have an uncle, he used to be a lobsterman. She discovered that they had norms of enforcement for this pro-social behavior. They divided up the lobster fishery so that your traps would be where they belong and, and everybody's traps were identifiable. Now, if they found the wrong trap in the wrong place, According to Eleanor, the first thing they'd do is they would tie a bow on it and they would throw it back overboard so that when that guy came to find it, he'd see the bow. We noticed you breaking our norms. If that wasn't good enough, then they would haul the trap in and they would meet him on the dock and they would say, you must have lost this trap. Only they would say it with an accent that I'm not sure I can uh, pull off. And if that didn't work, they would hand the trap back to him in pieces the next time. And if that didn't work, he would have no more boat. This, there was this threat of violence that, that undergirded all of these sort of tacit enforcement of the norms. So when you have this guy who's like, no, I'm just out for myself. I'm going to get the high score. All the people around him begin to socially push back. Now, it's a valid hypothesis. Like in a classroom where you're with all these people, who go to the same school as you, same major, you got team projects, that can be very persuasive. How does it look via Twitter? if you're playing with people in another culture, in another place? And the answer is not as persuasive. People uh, tend to band together, as, I mean, we know this from other literature, in their identity groups. And universities are outstanding at forming strong identity groups for the people who persist to the junior year. So when we've played this sort of cross-university thing, sure enough, it becomes RIT versus ASU versus Mountains of the Moon University in Uganda. And assessment is an enormous problem. How do you assess experience? Um, the thing about the multiple choice exam, which is the way our graduating seniors are examined, they take something called the fundamentals of engineering exam, and that's to see if they're fit for the certification as an intern engineer, which is the first stepping stone to becoming a credentialed professional engineer. The thing about those multiple choice exams is they have explicit answers, they ask explicit questions. The thing about experience is it's tacit. So what the students learn through experience is not expressible in explicit forms. And um, somebody asked me uh, to, to clarify the difference between uh, explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge. And I said, it's like this. We have uh, food critics. And they go eat at a restaurant. And they write a column. Or maybe it's a review on Yelp or something. They're trying to make the experience of being at the restaurant explicit so you can understand what it's like. How did that column taste? I mean, until you actually go to the restaurant and eat the food yourself, you don't have the full experience. Assessing experiential learning, because it's tacit, is an incredibly difficult problem. So now you say, uh, but we can observe behaviors. Does it change the behavior? And the answer is, I have no idea. Because the behaviors that we're actually trying to change, they happen out in, in the workplace when uh, we used to lose complete touch with our students. Now. Part of the assignment in my engineering business class is to connect with me on LinkedIn. So I don't know. I've got like hundreds of people that I'm connected to on LinkedIn so that I can continue to communicate with uh, my students if they choose and the occasion arises. But I can't like ask them, hey, did you do anything unethical at work this week? And it, it's too hard to assess whether we've moved the needle relative to a control group. What I'm going for instead is, have I got that emotional investment? And when I got students yelling at each other and crying in class, I know I have emotional investment. Whereas what I used to have was like, yeah, right, city court tower, got it, fix the joints. 
Absolutely. I want to produce ethical professionals. I don't know whether the Challenger case study is producing ethical professionals either. The Ford Pinto was in like the early 70s. The Citicorp Tower, late 70s. By the mid 80s, we were sending frozen Challenger O-rings up into the, so I could kind of make an argument, it's not working. But that's not fair because the technological context changes. We are no longer making automobiles that blow up when you rear end them at five miles an hour. So maybe something, I mean, in that context is changing. There are always new ethical dilemmas that present. Back to uh, something that we do in the class, um, that because you've said I'm a Kantian, uh, it, it reminded me to mention. One of the prompts that I use um, to, to kind of jog the students in their reflection, I ask them, what is your responsibility to fix those injustices that you didn't create? I'm the one to blame here. I created the unfairness. Now you get to decide what to do about it. And guess what? You're off the hook. You get to say, you know what? I'm lucky. I'm in the rich village. I didn't make the rules, but I'm living with them. You know, maybe I'm going to go all Rawlsy in on you here and be like, we all have, you know, the rules set up ahead of time, and this just happened to be where I land in the world. I'm going with it. Okay. But now, let me transfer from the game to the real world. Let's look at climate change. Climate change is not your fault. You know, at your age, in where we are on the curves, I really can't hold you responsible. Maybe it's your parents' fault or your grandparents' fault. Maybe it's your great-grandparents' fault for putting us on this whole Industrial Revolution tra trajectory in the first place, but I know it's not your fault. So what are you going to do about it? They're like, well, you know, actually, I kind of care about climate change. I kind of do want something for the future. Now you've got to reconcile this idea that you're not responsible for fixing other th things that other people broke, and you're living in a world that you want to be different than it is. So either, going back to our four-step model, either you're motivated to do something even though it isn't your fault and you're going to grow up and not be like Johnny started it, everybody's doing it, or you don't have that motivation and you don't have that courage. How does it feel? And when I do that, of course, they feel very small. And they're like, OK, um, I want to be thought of as someone who's courageous. I want to be thought of as someone who's caring about the planet. This is why I chose sustainable engineering in the first place. Worst experience I ever had with this game I was at a university which shall remain uh, nameless that uh, Jonathan and I both know. Um, I was in the industrial engineering department. And it was awful. Like, I'm used to dealing with the environmental and the sustainability people, and they bring kind of a strong personal ethic to what they're doing. And the industrial engineers were like, oh, yeah, we get it. We're totally fishing the crap out of this thing. Lake, gone. Two days later, hoarding. Everybody, you know, fails the whole exercise. And they're like, well, what'd you expect? You know, we're doing the right thing. I'm like, you all got Fs. And they're like, yeah, but that's because you set it up. You know, according to the rules, this is how we're supposed to behave. And look, we found the you know, Nash equilibrium of the competitive academic. Like, See, we solved it. I'm like, I, how, what, do you, what happens to you in industrial engineering? Where did that come from? You know? <laughs> so different disciplines, even within engineering, have different kind of cultural expectations. And I'm working, fortunately, with a set of students that aspires to something because they've chosen this degree program, but they don't know how to get there yet. They don't know where their own sort of biases and habits lie and what's holding them back. Occasionally, there are students who, I don't know, Jonathan might just say, there's your sociopath. Uh, and we need to know that too. Like, if we can identify them, terrific. But m for the most part, the students want to figure out uh, how to do the right thing. The question here is, how do, it's hard enough grading teamwork. Um, group work, it's difficult to parse out an individual grade. You know, when they request your transcript, they don't request the transcripts of everybody that you worked with, too. So it's an individual grade, and it's hard enough on a lab or something to grade group work. Now I've taken it to another level. Not only is it group work, but it's like meta-level group work. Now it's the whole class. Now it's a class that you never even met from a different university that kind of screwed you over when they extinguished your lake of fish. That's sir, I said. I'm not being fair because I want to create unfairness in the world and I want to put the responsibility on you uh, to deal with it. So the complaint that a student could make to my department chair or to an <coughs> academic advisor is that they're being graded unfairly. And my answer is, yes, you are. Now, some students in my class, they don't need to be reminded that the world is an unfair place. They've lived it as an unfair place. And so 
it's kind of condescending of me to say, hey, uh, you know, that's the way the world is. There are other students who haven't got a clue, who are sailing through their lives of privilege, feeling good about themselves because, I don't know, they have a hybrid car or something like that. And, you know, they're a good person because they recycle. And this, being confronted with this idea that uh, they might they choose to accept responsibility for things that they didn't break, that is a revelation. For the other students, it's 5% of their grade is their game performance. It's enough to make the difference, say, between a B plus and an A. It's enough to put something at stake. But it's also enough for me to say there's so much else uh, going on in the class. What I want is the emotional investment. If I make it 1% and I get the emotional investment, then that's all it needs to be. If I make it 5 and I don't, then I've got to uh, take it up to 10. Now, that's a bit of a cop-out. It's like I'm giving up the principle and I'm arguing in practice, you know, how much of an uh, influence on their grade does it really have. Because uh, the students sometimes get angry about, at me, especially when I, like, accidentally kill fish, and I swear to God it was an accident. Uh, but they're like, where did our grade go? Um, I ask them, is it ethical for me to even position you in these problems where I have a lot of empirical evidence that says this could go badly. Some classes, they get together, they hug it out, and they do great. But uh, most classes go badly. I know you're going to do poorly. Even though we've done the fundamental canons and we've done our case studies and all that kind of stuff, um, I'm putting you in this position that is unfair, in which the only way to advance your grade is to impoverish your classmates. Is that ethical of me? And we have kind of a big debate about it. Typically. The students will judge me based upon my intent, which they can never really know, but they can sort of deduce. They say, we don't see anything in it for you. Like, you don't get rich if we all fail the game. So you must be giving us this game and putting us in these circumstances for our own good, like, you know, for our education. Maybe that's just like Stockholm Syndrome or some kind of cognitive dissonance kicking in. But they cut me a break. They say, we don't think it's unethical because you have our best interests at heart. And I'm like, oh, that's going to save me you know, a lecture in the department chair's <laughs> office. They're very generous with me when I acknowledge that it's a legitimate question to whether we can even do this uh, in class. And I think that uh, when students see that I understand their perspective, I understand their own emotional experience of playing the game, there's so much less at stake for them to like go down to the department chair's office. And instead, I've had students coming up to me like, I really got screwed on the game. Is there extra credit I can do? Of course there's extra credit you can do. I mean, it's a big class. And anyone who comes up to me and says, I want to work harder in your class, I'm like, I applaud you. Uh, I have escaped now, what are we on, six years or something like that, without having to make an accounting of myself to the faculty senate. But I only do that by staying in close contact with my students. They're all on Twitter. When they're angry at me, they let me know. They let the entire Twitterverse know. And it gives me an opportunity to intervene, to give them an audience before that uh, spins out of control. It's a really delicate question. Other instructors who have done this, uh, one in particular, had a hard time of it. Um, a student brought a formal complaint. Um, because it, it wasn't an engineering class, um, I'm not sure if this student was a minority in his discipline. But it would have been in mine. And um, he had to make an accounting of himself to his department chair. And there, it so helped that we were publishing journal articles. We have a grant from the National Science Foundation. We do have a theoretical underpinning to what we're doing. We have a cold learning cycle that says experiential education. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't real strong on the assessment uh, side, but we had uh, these qualitative uh, approach to saying what the student experience was, and the department chair bought it, he ran it again, and he got better at running it. The social and emotional intelligence exhibited by the instructor is critically important here. But that's also something that I want to model for the students. I want them to also sort of develop the social and emotional uh, capacity. So if I can show them that in uh, kind of real time, then there's another uh, learning opportunity. How is it that you're not teaching people to be the shark, to be the one person who in 2008 is packaging mortgages that are worthless and selling them to all the other fish in the pond? And why is this 
Why is that not the lesson of this game, to, to be the one person who actually does it? Yeah, that lesson is available in lots of different places. And the game is structured in exactly that way. So uh, why is it not? I don't know. Uh, maybe that's exactly what the game is teaching that one guy. And in a bigger world, to be the one-tenth of one percent who is now a thousand people and makes your own society out of it, who does exactly that and feels really great. Now let's consider the alternative. Let's say I change the grading structure and I reward with the grade the ethical behavior. What I've done now is I've removed the moral choice. I've it's, I put the students in a situation where they sort of have their cake and they eat it too. That sociopathic person would understand where the grade is attached, exhibit the moral behavior, the ethical behavior, even though their intent is just motivated by the grade. What I've presented to my students is a replica, a virtual analog to what they will face in their careers. Your choice is, do you plagiarize? Do you copy data? Do you advance your own agenda at the expense of the profession? And the incentives that they will face are the ones that I'm uh, virtually creating in the classroom. I want them to confront that here before they enter the profession. But I cannot vouch. I've given up a lot of the authority and control that I have uh, by being this mirror and pushing things back on the students for them to resolve themselves. Someday, I'll be dead, and my students are going to inherit this profession. Because it's a profession, it is self-governing. We are judged in engineering by our peers. When we are accused of ethical lapses, we create a jury of peers that decide whether we have performed, as the accused engineer, in a reasonable way that any other professional would be expected to perform. So we also start the process in school of that peer review, that peer judging process. I agree with you that I'm taking risks, but I don't think those risks relative to the alternative really have too much to lose. So they're only misbehaving um, in the eyes of the people who disapprove of that behavior. Right. The industrial engineers never solve a, saw a problem. I'm like, no, 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 moral sensitivity. And they're like, what? The social pressure turns out to be incredibly powerful. If you read Diane Vaughn's account of the challenger, she's like, no, no. It was not like the evil managers versus the good technical engineer type people. All of those managers, they were educated as engineers. They were promoted up through a technical culture. This whole bad apple, good whistleblower thing, she says, it does not hold for the challenger case. It's more complex than that. The people who warned that it was too cold and unsafe to launch, yeah, they'd warned like six out of the last seven launches. And all those went OK. So when that decision was made, she gives an account that I'm, I'm not quite, I'm oversimplifying. I'm not quite representing it faithfully. But all the people around the table, they're voting like, yeah, we should launch. Each one of them reported private misgivings. But each one of them said, well, Joe's pretty smart. Joe just voted to launch, so I don't want to look like an idiot. That whole peer dynamic turns out to be, that's what we call culture, you know, incredibly important. And now a decision to launch becomes inevitable, not because of any one influential person who, uh, I don't know, did the calculation purposely wrong or changed numbers or failed to report data, but because this collective was just going down a route that nobody had the courage to, to put an end to, to, to break from whatever the peer uh, thing is.